All right, so let's talk about rings. Um, when we look at the Jovian planets, all of them have a ring system of some sort, um, but they are not all the same color, the same um, you know, mass, anything like that. So Jupiter has a very faint ring um, and Saturn's rings are the ones you probably think of. Those are bright, wide, very massive um, compared to the rest of the Jovians. But even Uranus and Neptune have a ring system. Uh, in both cases, they're fairly narrow and they're darker in color. Uh, the materials composing the ring are darker in color compared to Saturn's rings. So when we look at the size comparison of all of these rings, Saturn's are definitely the largest and brightest, um, but Jupiter's rings actually extend quite far from its center. Um, those rings are just less visible because there's a, a lower density of material there. And then Uranus and Neptune have relatively small ring systems, um, but proportional to the size of the planet. And there are these kind of arcs. So different structures show up in each of these different ring systems. Um, the way that we figured out that planets had rings in the first place what has a little bit of a history. So Galileo in 1616 thought that Saturn was a triple star system um, because it looks like three bright points in a sort of lower quality telescope. So the early telescopes were unable to resolve those rings. Um, but sometimes the smaller bodies disappeared. And so he was confused about how that could be the case if this was a triple star system. In 1659, Huygens was able to resolve those um, rings with his telescope and was also able to reason out why we see different shapes at different times. And the explanation for the different appearance of Saturn at different times of our year um, can be explained if you assume that Saturn has a ring around it. So this is the history of how we know that Saturn has rings. And um, what actually, you know, are rings made of? You might assume, you know, if you're an early astronomer, that this is sort of one solid piece. Uh, but you might also consider it could be a swarm of tiny moons that conspire together to create a ring appearance. So how might we figure out which one of these hypotheses is correct? All right. So I'm starting to see a few themes here. Um, one of them is that a solid piece seems unlikely because it, it could break up over time. Um, so even if it were solid, then it, it seems like it would eventually be broken up into smaller pieces. Um, the other idea is that the if it were a collection of pieces, then those pieces would interact with each other. And maybe you could actually detect some of those interactions. Maybe you could actually see them bouncing off of each other or forming waves as some sort of disturbance passes through them. So any, any sort of um, you know, ability to measure those dynamics of those collection of pieces would be helpful, definitely. Um, what I had in mind was if a, solid, if a ring was a solid piece, then the inner pieces and outer pieces would all rotate around Saturn at the same rate. But if it's composed of individual objects, then because of Kepler's third law, the objects um, in the inner orbits should orbit faster than the objects in the outer orbit. And so you could look at individual um, you know, features of the ring, even if you can't see if that's an individual particle, maybe there's a, a particular you know, bright spot that you can follow and see if it orbits faster or slower than a similar feature that you could track near the outside of the ring. So this has been done. And indeed, this is how we can know for sure that Saturn's rings are a collection of small moonlets. So because those are a collection of small pieces, then it is true that their interactions leads to specific structures in the ring. Uh, most of the material is made of ice, but there are also ice, um, sorry, rocky chunks. So when we look at Saturn's ring materials, we can take a photo and then color code by what type of composition it is. So the blue shaded regions on this image are icy materials, whereas the red is more rocky material. 
And the rocky material is present mainly in the gaps between rings. Um, there's, you know, many moons of Saturn. Some of them are icy, many of them are icy, um, but some of them are quite rocky. So for example, Phoebe is a very rocky moon, about 50% rock compared to only 35% for the other small moons. And Phoebe lives in a gap. So let me ask you about how big do you think the objects in planetary rings are compared to, for example, objects in the asteroid belt? Okay, I'm seeing most votes for the objects in rings being smaller. And that's exactly right. So um, for asteroids in the asteroid belt, um, those rocks can range from about 10 meters, so quite small, would fit you know, in your living room or something like that, to 530 kilometers, which is pretty big. That's like, well, I can't do the conversion in my head, but um, 10 kilometers is six miles. So it's 60 times 600. Yeah, it's a lot of miles. Cannot math in my brain in the morning. Um, but when we look at the rings, and the particles in the rings, then most of Saturn's moons have diameters that are less than that. And so that means that if rings are composed of the broken up pieces of those moons, they're going to be even smaller. So when we actually look, oops, why are you doing that? Um, when we actually look at the sizes of different rings, um, we can again color code Saturn's rings by how big the particles typically are. So in these blue regions, these are areas where particles are smaller than about two inches. Um, the green is a little bit smaller than that, between one and two inches. And then the reds are um, larger than two inches. So in general, these are just little clumps, like smaller or on the same size as ice cubes from your freezer. All right, um, inside the rings, there are some moons that orbit inside. And a lot of the times these moons are ravioli shaped. So where do you think that comes from? Where do you think this sort of uh, tutu shape, the skirt on those ravioli moons comes from? Just take a quick minute and type your ideas in the chat. All right, yeah, lots of productive ideas so far here. Awesome. So it could be that they experience forces that pull them into those shapes, maybe. Um, it could be possible that they're just simply not big enough to condense into a sphere. Um, let's see, maybe there's other stuff that clumped to their surface um, and maybe they've been a little bit partially broken up by impacts from debris within the rings. All of those are good productive ideas. Um, but a, a very considerable hint is that they orbit inside the rings. And so, because they're inside the rings, they actually just get coated by the ring material. So regardless of what you know, shapes that those were before, I think you're right, probably not spherical because they're not massive enough to be pulled into a sphere, <clears throat> but also they're, you know, whatever potato shape they had before now has a skirt around it made of ring material. So I love the ravioli moons. I think they're extremely cute. All right, the rings in general, are really flat compared to their diameter. They're only about 30 feet thick. So that's you know only a few stories of a building tall compared to an enormous planet. Um, and the other thing that we of course notice about the ring structure is these gaps. So I wanna talk about these gaps a little bit more. Um, based on your reading, see if you recall why those gaps form. Yeah, so I see a lot of votes for four, quite a few for one. So yeah, indeed, some of those gaps are in resonance with Saturn's moons. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. And some of the gaps are cleared out by small moons that orbit within those gaps. So both one and two are specific reasons. Um, let's see, this little gap here is called the Enki gap and that one is cleared out by the moon Pan. So that's one example. Um, okay, so let's explore how do Saturn's moons create these gaps? Well, we can think about gravity as one potential reason 
So question, let's suppose that a moon and then a small piece of ring were close together in space. Um, what direction would the gravitational force between them be? All right, yeah, exactly. Gravity is a attractive force. And so it would pull these objects together. So then thinking about how could gaps be formed, um, if we look at the situation of an orbital resonance, this is where these two objects are orbiting the same planet and their orbital period is related by some sort of ratio. So for example, maybe this larger object, if it's farther from Saturn, makes two orbits in the time that this object makes three. If they're in some sort of orbital resonance with whole numbers like that, then they'll, they'll reach conjunctions very often. Conjunctions are just places where they um, are sort of lined up across from each other in their orbit or next to each other in their orbit. And so when those um, situations happen, it's like that they receive a little, um, a little bit of a tug every time they reach a conjunction. And so it's kind of like pushing a kid on a swing. If you push on any object periodically with a regular, um, a regular timing, then those pushes add up to something large in amplitude. And so the net result for this is actually that the objects move away from each other, even though you might expect gravitationally that they move toward each other. Um, the reason for this is a little bit hard to explain, but I found a figure that I think does a decent job. If you assume that this dark object at the center of this image is a moon, and that the small objects are um, ring particles that are relatively nearby, maybe even within the same orbital distance as that moon. If, a, if, it, if the ring particle experiences a pull from the moon, then it'll sort of accelerate toward the moon. And if it gets faster, then it's gonna get kicked out into an orbit farther from the planet. And so as a result, um, objects that are moving toward um, in the same direction as the moon would get kicked out into farther orbits, whereas objects that were sort of ahead of the moon in its orbit would actually be pulled down into slower orbits um, near the inside of the moon. So those um, little differences in how the moon affects the particle's orbital velocities, that's ultimately what's behind this um, sort of counterintuitive thought that the objects move away from each other. So that's my sort of maybe intuitive argument for how this works. The net, net result of this is that moons can cause ring gaps by sort of clearing out those distances by pushing away the objects that are in the distances that are in resonance with it. So at specific orbital distances, those will have a specific orbital period. If that period is in resonance with the moon's period in some way, then that distance will get cleared of material. All right, so um, as an example then, as the moon sort of orbits around, it'll just push material out from a given orbital distance until eventually over time that will become completely empty of material. Cool. All right, so that's, this is one thing that Shepard, what we call Shepard moons can do. They can clear out orbits and create gaps, um, but Shepard moons can also create um, confined ring structures, really thin structures like this. So the idea is that if there's a moon on one side <clears throat> of a ring, it will push particles in that ring away from it. But if there's also a moon on the other side, it will push particles the opposite direction. And so together, the combined pushes of both of those shepherd moons can actually confine a ring into a thin band. So not only do we sometimes get gaps, but we sometimes also get thin bands because of the presence of moons. <clears throat> 